Welcome to a sponsored webinar by Columo, hosted by CPA Australia, Crisis Ready with an Agile Finance Function. My name is Melissa and I will be hosting this webinar and available for any troubleshooting questions you might have with your WebEx setup. We have people joining us from all over the country for today's webinar. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners from around Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. I would now like to introduce you to today's chair, Gavin from CPA Australia, who will facilitate this session. Gavin, I'll open your mic now. Thank you, Great, and we can welcome, hear you. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome everybody. Uh, as uh, I actually work for CPA Australia, and I'm their business investment policy advisor within CPA Australia. And it is my pleasure to, uh, today to invite Dominic Parsons and John Wise to present this webinar. Just to give you a, a brief background of both Dominic and John. Uh, Dominic Parsons is a managing, managing director and evangelist of um, Calamo Group. Dominic has a passion for the increasing engagement of people with data. And that's incredibly, I think the, uh, the crisis has shown how important data is. But simply effective data engagement empowers people and produces better commercial outcomes. Dominic sees this critical ingredient for modern business success across the enterprises, across enterprise from the perspective of a pragmatic and progressive former CFO. During his career, Dominic has participated in, directed or been responsible for thousands of business intelligence, reporting and planning projects across hundreds of companies. From his early days at Price Waterhouse, as a chartered accountant, Dominic has spent the last 25 years in the ICT sector in a range of commercial roles, including seven years at board level. For the past nine years, Dominic has led the Calamo Group, APAC's first cloud-based business intelligence reporting, planning and forecasting specialist. Calamo recently achieved number, the number one ranking in 20 categories in the BARC BI Survey 2019. John Wise. So John was originally from the UK and also trained at Price Waterhouse and worked in both the UK and Hungary before seeing the light and emigrating to Australia in 1990, where he continued to work to Price with Price Waterhouse before it became PwC. In 1999, he joined Savills as their CFO, where he further developed extensive experience in the property services sector. 2016, John joined Acumentus and has been instrumental in completely overhauling their shared services function in a short time to ensure they were able to support an aggressive growth mandate, including two large acquisitions in 2017 and 2018. I'd be interested to hear uh, what John might see around the acquisitions path in the next little while as well. John has a Bachelor of Science, uh, has an honours degree in science, in mathematics and is a fellow of the ICAE Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. John has utilised Calamo, Cognos and TN1 business intelligence software for over 20 years and has implemented multiple finance and other systems in various roles. He has integrated and streamlined shared services teams following their acquisitions and is always looking to provide business he works within and the teams he leads with the best systems, processes, so they can achieve their full potential. I'm really looking forward to hearing what both Dominic and John have to say with their incredible experience, uh, particularly at this uh, difficult time. As Melissa said, today we'll be taking questions through our Q&A box. Please direct questions to all panelists. We will address the questions at the conclusion of the presentations, and we will do our best with the time remaining. For any troubleshooting, please send a message to the host using the chat box. It's now time for our session to commence, so I'll hand over to Dominic. Thanks, Gavin. Just a test, uh, can we all hear me? Yes. Very good. Thanks for that. Uh, and uh, I'd add my welcome to Gavin's. 
We've got a, a jam-packed session today. Uh, I only have an hour. Uh, I'll keep it light on, on what Kalumo is about. Uh, for my part, I'll be talking about the foundations of Agile with a capital A, uh, and I want to leave John as much time as possible for his story because uh, I know you'll enjoy it. Um, I usually can take about an hour to go through this material, so I'm going to be moving quite quickly. And just for an added, bit, added degree of difficulty, uh, we're going to be asking about 14 questions as we go through this um, presentation. So the first one, just to make sure all the mechanics are working, is do you know what Agile is? That's Agile with a capital A, as opposed to whether you can pass a football really quickly and easily. Um, so two reasons for the questions. The first one is we're releasing a white paper in August called uh, Agile is not just for software development. Uh, and the second one is we're analytics people, so we're, we're real junkies for feedback. We've got a great uh, group of finance professionals here, and I would love to get your input on uh, how you see these Agile principles. I'm also aware a lot of people say Agile at the moment, uh, particularly given the circumstance that we're in, but they really don't have the, the heritage in Agile to understand what that means and therefore to be able to apply it well. Okay, now I will be moving quickly, but if you've got any questions, we will make sure there's time at the end. And of course, we're not going anywhere. We've been here for about 15 years, so uh, you can always reach out to us and my details are on your screen. Okay, so let's dive in. So what's Kalimo about? Uh, simply, we help extraordinary teams achieve their extraordinary goals with business data. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, they're extraordinary teams because they're looking to make a difference. They're looking to do things differently. As you'll see, Agile with a capital A is underneath everything that we do and the people that we work with. Uh, about us as a company, we're, we're that uh, rarest of breeds, which is an Australian software development company that develops all of our software on shore. We were founded by accountants, uh, been around since 2004, uh, and we build the tools that we wish we had when we were in practice. Uh, most of the uh, senior people at um, Columo uh, have a finance background, uh, and we're building those tools that finance people need. We build those, we're a Microsoft Gold partner and have been for over 10 years. We build those tools on the Microsoft platform for data analytics, which many of you are probably using now. We, so for those who don't know what performance management is, it's a term of art, and it means basically dashboards, data discovery reports, budgeting, planning, forecasting, real-time reporting, ad hoc and self-service analytics, that one source of truth. Kalumo provides uh, finance teams with that one source of truth that they can then radiate across their organizations. And as I said, we do that uh, from the uh, Microsoft Modern Data Platform, as well as our own software. We've got thousands of users uh, spread across a range of industries from not-for-profits through to um, very large corporates. Uh, our, we're very scalable. We go from five users in our cloud product uh, all the way through to um, companies who are using more than 1,500 users a month uh, in the cloud with Kalumo. Uh, and I didn't mention earlier, but we do on-prem in the cloud and any kind of hybrid. So that wherever you want to develop that, that one source of truth, we can help you. Okay, now let's get on to Agile Foundations. And as I do that, I'll change my background because now I'm talking about uh, stuff that doesn't involve what I do on a day-to-day -day basis other than from a philosophical point of view. So, this session really uh, looks at um, understanding the origins of Agile. So, a lot of people say Agile, very few people understand where it came from, and, and it's really important to know where it came from to be able to legitimately say we're Agile and to, for your teams to literally be Agile. So, in the top right-hand corner is a web page, uh, agilemanifesto.org. It was the outcome of a conversation a, uh, an in-service that a bunch of um, IT professionals had back in uh, 2001. And they arrived at some principles, uh, sorry, they arrived at some realizations and some principles about software development. They were trying to make better software. But in the process, they articulated some principles that had much broader application. So it was focused on software development, but it was pragmatic in a way that appeals to accountants. I first came across it in 2008, and I couldn't believe that IT guys had written this thing uh, because I was involved in many pragmatic activities in finance, and I had struggled somewhat with, um, uh, with IT functions that couldn't move as quickly as we needed to. So um, a lot of people think that Agile is about digital transformation and technology, and you need to buy a new tool and all those, kind of, those kinds of things, and a lot of vendors like to push that message. But in fact, Agile is all about humans, not technology. It's about collaboration and achievement. I won't read this whole quote because it's quite long, and you can get it at agilemanifesto.org. 
but it gives you an idea. This is written by Jim Highsmith, who's written some of the most important books in Agile, and he was he was in that um, that session. And he talks about ridding, ridding ourselves of Dilbert manifestations. He talks about the people who don't like Agile often being those being uh, corporate bureaucrats who aren't focused on customer but like the way things work now. And they're the kind of attitudes that we can't afford in an Agile environment. The kind of attitudes we certainly can't afford as we now move into distributed work and, and the uh, impacts of, of uh, post-COVID. We seem to be into phase two, and I hope this will be our last phase with COVID, but uh, who knows? So they didn't pull any punches. Their realizations, and this is about software development, but I think you'll start to echo the feelings that these guys have and recognize the human nature of Agile. So they realize that they value individual and interactions over processes and tools. Not binary, not one or the other, but, if they, had, but they recognize that individuals and interactions are very important. Working software or outcomes, more important than comprehensive uh, documentation. They value customer collaboration rather than contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. Again, all of those eight things are important, but they, they are laboring the human side, and that's, that's the origins of Agile. So, to go from uh, a software methodology to a broader methodology, if we replace uh, valuable or working software with commercial outcome, we pretty much get there. Um, now, commercial outcome is a term that we might use. You can use any term you like, and you'll see how it's engaged with as we go through this. But it's really being clear about what is the outcome of any team, small, large, you know, multiple departments, one department, what are we really chasing? What is our standard of value? We talk about commercial outcomes because in the projects that we do, often that can be lost sight of. And the commercial outcome takes into consideration not just what we spend, but what we get in return. What are the things we're trying to achieve as an organization? It should be tied into vision and values. So one of the principles, and again, forgive me, I am moving quickly, but I've got about seven minutes to get through 12 principles. Hopefully you can stay with me and start to answer these questions. Uh, you'll get two questions per slide and we'll keep uh, two sets of those up at any point in time. So principle one, and these have been modified slightly from the original Agile principles you'll find on agilemanifesto.com. So our highest priority is to satisfy our stakeholders through early and continuous delivery of outcomes, of commercial outcomes. So, Really, I don't know if any of you have um, spent time reading uh, uh, Stephen Covey's, Covey's um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But, you know, a lot of Agile actually ties into to what he does and or, or to how he was thinking at the time. So um, uh, I'm going to tie him into a couple of these. Um, Yeah, so Covey talks about integrity in the moment of choice. So when people sit down to do work, doing the right work, choosing the right things. And principle one is about how we prioritise work and how we see it. And in terms of the gambler, that's a, that's a motif I sometimes use to explain to teams who is a stakeholder. Somebody who's taking a risk on our performance, who's taking a risk on us um, for return, whether that be a board, whether that be a customer who's trusting us, a colleague who works with us in a project, um, or another part of the organisation that relies on the outcome of what we do and the processes that we establish. So the questions are, is the principle uh, important to great performance? What is your view? And the second question is, is this principle demonstrated daily by you, your team, some departments, most departments or company-wide? The first one, choose one item. The second one, choose any number that makes sense. Principle two, we welcome changing requirements even late in the delivery. Agile processes harness change for the business's competitive advantage. So at five minutes to midnight, someone makes a change. How do we respond? Do we respond with, sorry, that wasn't in the spec. That's not how we do things here. This is not my job. Or do we say, tell me more about why this is important to you and how it will help. Can we do it with what we already have? What goal are we chasing and who agrees with you? These are questions, if we're agile, that we ask somebody who wants to make a change to what we're doing. Deliver commercial outcomes frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. We don't believe in the one-year project that uh, delivers, that everybody has to hold their breath to find out a result. When finance is working with the rest of the business, we want to involve the business as often as possible, be producing things, be clear about the things that we're producing, a preference for the shorter time scale to bring back results and see how we're going. Business people and finance people must work together daily. I wrote in my notes, peekaboo, come out from behind the spreadsheet. Uh, and finance, good finance teams, agile finance teams are doing that interaction 
on a daily basis and need to be called to account to be doing. And as managers, we need to be telling them that it's a priority for us and that we don't think that's a waste of time, that that's valuable. Principle five, build projects around motivated individuals, give, the, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. It seems basic, but it is a basic tenet of Agile. And it's also a checkpoint that we can use for ourselves. It's obvious, if you wanna get something done, give it to a busy person. The question is, could you pick out five times in the last month where you've actually done this? Hopefully you can. Principle six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a business team is face-to-face -face conversation. I have to educate, well, I have to work with our teams all the time to keep coming back to that. So many different ways to communicate and such poor communication. Welcome to the, the 2020s. Um, so I actually have a, a hierarchy of a hierarchy of communication tools where conversation is king. Now, each tool has their use, but if we're trying to get common understanding, face-to-face -face conversation is key. Don't forget, the guys who wrote these principles wrote them 20 years ago, before we had social media, before we had so many means to communicate, and yet they were highlighting at that point, and it remains true today, that there's no substitute for face-to-face. Okay. Commercial outcome is the primary measure of progress. Again, you can insert the primary measure of your choice here. The important thing is that there is a well-articulated and understood measure of progress in an organization. You know, it's, it could be commercial outcome for me encapsulates aligned with mission and vision and values, being able to point to the work that we do today and say, this is how we're progressing. This is an agile concept to be able to constantly measure, are we getting there? Are we reaching important, important milestones? Principle eight, agile processes promote sustainable performance uh, improvement. Sponsors, finance and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. These concepts are not about once-off activities. The changes that we make in finance and the way we run, if we are truly agile, are utterly sustainable. They're baked into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Now, this is not where perfection is the, the, uh, the enemy of the good. This is continuous attention, not surrender. So we know that technical excellence is important and good design is important as well. Anyone who's inherited a bad ERP implementation or a terrible chart of accounts will know that someone has to pay eventually. So attending to, paying attention to technical excellence, weighing that and good design is important because where we engage with those concepts, we reduce how much we have to do to continually improve and that enhances our agility. If the job looks too hard because we've had bad design, we're probably gonna delay that and we're not going to be able to get continuous performance improvement or agility. Principle 10, simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. I could talk about this one for an hour by itself. I'm a firm believer in this. I describe myself as a, as a lazy person, but I have tremendous output. And that's because I have productivity. And because the first thing I wanna do is make sure I understand what is needed rather than run off and just start working. I think we've all had people in our teams who struggle with this concept, but it's absolutely key. And it's a key tenet of Agile. Principle 11, the best architectures, requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Sounds a bit techy. It's probably the most techy sounding one of all the principles. But in reality, in anything that we do, whatever processes we design that we then push out across organizations, um, we have to create those things. We have to know what's needed. We have to design what we're going to do and then we have to deliver it. And a self-organizing team is a team that doesn't wait for a manager to tell them what they have to do. They can identify their own priorities, they can design and organize their work and they can get on with it. And this is something that ideally when we're an agile finance team, we're doing and we're doing on a cross-functional basis. Now it doesn't mean there's no management, it just means that it's not waiting for the individual to make all the calls. We're giving people that trust to get going. Principle 12, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. So back to Mr. Covey, Stephen Covey, back in 1989, uh, his last habit was sharpen the saw. And this is really what this is about. But again, as a principle, to call yourself agile, you really have to have evidence that this is something that you do. Not just a great idea, but this is something that you do on a regular basis and your team will get great benefit. All right. 
Um, I know I've gone through that quickly. There's more to say, um, and, I, and we're happy to do it uh, after the session or maybe in question time. Uh, there will be a Kalimo white paper coming out in August that covers these concepts and expands on them and looks at the original principles. You can register by email at agile at Kalimo com. I have one final question for you, uh, which is, did you learn something new about Agile today that you'll share with others? Simply yes or no. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, as I close out, um, I, I'm really looking forward to John's talk. I don't expect him to be picking out Agile principles as I've explained them to you here, but I can say that John is one of the most Agile CFOs that uh, we've had, or I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. Um, and I think you'll see the ideas of Agile resonating in what he presents. So at that point, I'm going to hand you across to John's capable hands. Yeah, um, Agile. Can everybody hear me? Hi, John. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. A little good. So thanks again, Dominic, for that. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the organisation that I've been working for for the last three, three and a bit years, um, and certainly how agile the finance team was forced to be, but also how we put in place uh, processes and ways of working to allow us to do that. Next slide, please. So, um, first of all, I'll just give you a quick introduction to the company. Um, I put together a slide where I see what the differences are between what I call a traditional finance function and an agile one. Um, I'm then going to outline the challenges that Acumentus um, has faced over the last three years, um, how we navigated through those changes, um, what the lessons we learned from them and what the future holds for the Acumentus finance team. Uh, so initially, we'll just give you this company overview. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so Acumentus is actually a very new company from a name point of view, uh, but it's an old company. Um, it was called Landmark White or LMW. Um, we acquired MVS in May 2017 and then Taylor Bird in October 2018. Um, we're the only uh, valuation and advisory firm listed on the ASX. Uh, we have over 99% local ownership with a mixture of executives and employees, vendors of the acquired companies, micro cap managers and private investors in the organization. Being listed on the ASX uh, requires us to have a high level of corporate governance and transparency. Um, and as you'll see through this talk, uh, that has had its benefits and disadvantages during our recent experiences. Um, the listed environment certainly helped the company um, accessing new capital, which we'll talk about later on as well. Um, so now I just uh, want to show a little short video uh, which explains how Acumentus came to be. LMW has a long and proud history.
Okay, yeah, so one of the key things uh, that the video uh, explained was that we're now very much a national organization uh, with a very strong uh, coverage both in metropolitan cities but also regionally. And that actually sets us apart from some of our competition who can service the regional areas but with a fly in, fly out approach. Uh, whereas Acumentus prides itself to be part of the local communities that we actually operate within. I've just got the next slide not working. Sorry about that. Sorry, Melissa, the slide button's not going, so maybe I can get you to just move the next slide. Yes, yeah, I think we'll do that. If you just prompt me, I'll move along for you. Yeah, so traditional versus agile finance. So there's an old cliche, you know, change is a constant, um, and certainly that has been the case in the last decade or more for finance teams. Um, there's been constantly changing uh, reporting requirements, um, accounting standards, many of which arguably make financials more opaque, um, certainly in the last few years. Um, add to this the challenges following the GFC, and now of course COVID-19, and it's certainly been a turbulent time for businesses in general, um, and their finance teams in particular. For Acumentus, we can overlay all of that with some existential cyber attacks, um, and it's certainly obvious that uh, my finance team has had to maintain a high degree of agility. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, I've tried to attempt to set out what I believe the, the contrasts are between a traditional and an agile um, finance function. Uh, many would say that a traditional function is well past its use by date, but a modern agile finance function is fit for purpose in the current environment. There's probably other differences that I've, that I've missed there. Uh, for me, the key thing for an agile finance team is a can-do attitude. Gone are the days when the finance team had to be the gatekeeper um, with the response, we can't do that because, we can't do that this is the always the way we've done it. This is how it should be done. Um, what I strongly believe is that a finance team needs to understand what their clients want and then work out how it can be delivered. Um, so very much a change from that. We can't do that. This is the way we've always done it. Sorry. To, okay, let's work out what we're trying to achieve here and then let's work out how the finance function can help the business achieve that. Um, I think the finance team also has to continually question um, what the business is asking for um, to challenge them to make sure um, that we continue to deliver what they want. Um, we need to get away from procedures, uh, structured approaches, you know, focus on data entry, paper documents, manual reconciliations, complex Excel models, static reports, emailing, all that um, stuff that used to occupy a lot of time in finance functions. Um, now we have to be much more flexible. We have to focus on analysis rather than data entry. Everything needs to be electronic, even more so now that we're largely working from home. We've got to automate as much of the drudgery um, as we can. Um, and we need to make sure that we're using appropriate business intelligence tools, not just within the finance team, but throughout the organization. Um, and we need to visualize data. Um, Non-finance people particularly can um, drown in data, numbers, details, tables, columns. So it's important that we visualize that data, um, provide actionable information rather than just data. Um, and certainly I'm a strong believer in live reports, um, allowing the business to sell service whenever they want it, not when finance is able to deliver it to them. 
Next slide, please. So I've probably covered a couple of these things um, in the previous slide, but the key principles, I believe, for an agile finance team um, are always that we should be um, principles-based rather than rules-based. Um, we've got to acknowledge that we have to follow accounting and tax rules, of course, um, and they continue to form an, an important part of a finance function. Um, but they're really just the data day must-haves of any finance function. They're not going to set aside um, how good your finance function is compared to your finance function. Um, and you're certainly not going to add value to the business if you're focused purely on that. We need to make sure we focus on the big picture. Um, you know, people talk about the 80-20 rule, and you can argue about whether or not that ratio is correct. But at the end of the day, there are some things which are way more important than others, and we need to make sure that they are given the weight and the importance and the time that they deserve. <laughs> we don't spend all of our time on the stuff, um, which quite often accountants like to do because they're very much in their comfort zone. Um, already mentioned, we need to do, deliver actionable information rather than just data. We need to keep checking what our clients um, want and challenging them to confirm that we are delivering what they want um, and probe and question them all the time. Um, just like in software development, uh, I think when finance are asked to do something, I think it's important that we deliver preliminary results as quickly as possible on an ongoing basis, rather than waiting that extra few days or week to completely polish and finish off a detailed report. Um, you know, certainly the businesses um, I've worked with over many years um, want to even just hear a verbal update or give them some verbal guidance before a formal report might follow um, thereafter. Next slide, please. So now we move on to um, the specific challenges that Acumentus has faced over the last uh, three and a bit years um, and the time that I've spent with them and how we address them. Next slide. So our challenges. Um, it's certainly been an interesting time to be CFO of this business. Um, I joined the business in 2016. Uh, late 2016, and there was a focus on rapid growth via acquisitions. Uh, the business was listed on the ASX, but it was arguably way too small to actually add value to its shareholders in the ASX environment. ASX, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, provides lots of benefits, but what comes with it um, is the need for um, a significant overhead um, you know, an independent board, um, all the checks and balances that go with being an ASX listed. And if you're small, um, the costs quite often outweigh the benefit. Um, and that was the position that Landmark White, as it was then called, um, was in at that time. Um, they headhunted myself um, to join them. Um, I'd had a lot of experience uh, working with Savills um, and doing M&A. Um, and they could see that the company needed um, to grow very quickly. First thing I actually did when I joined was um, change all of the systems. So the systems they had in place uh, were not fit for purpose. Um, they ran maybe on the smell of an oily rag. There'd been little investment in the IT um, and certainly not in the finance. Um, and I could see straight away that there was no way that this backbone could support an aggressive growth plan. Um, so we moved very quickly um, to cloud-based financials, um, system called Intact. We were actually the second company in Australia to choose that system. Um, and a few people maybe raised their eyebrows when I chose that. Um, the main reason for choosing Intact was that it had been written from day one for the cloud. So it wasn't a mainframe solution, an AS400 solution, IBM, et cetera, being converted to a Windows solution and then a web front end put on the front. Um, from day one, it was written for the web. And you can see and feel that when you use it. 
which I think is a real uh, point of difference. Um, I mustn't have been alone in that because not long ago, Sage in the UK acquired Intact to fill their middle um, market um, solution for cloud-based accounting. We also migrated all of our payroll um, to, again, very much a modern cloud-based solution called Employment Hero, um, which is so intuitive to use and fast um, to use that we no longer have a dedicated payroll manager with reduced staff. Um, yeah, a few clicks, a few hours each uh, fortnight, and we can pay all of our staff very easily. And of course, we put Kalumo BI over the top of all of these systems and over the top of our valuation management system um, to provide the business with non-financial data. Um, so we acquired MVS in 2017, Taylor Byrne in 2018. Uh, things were looking pretty good. We um, almost trebled our revenue. Um, and then along came cyber attacks, not one, but two during 2019. That required us to um, restructure the business and undertake a capital raise. Um, unusually, um, a suspect was arrested in October 2019. We all breathed a sigh of release, rolled into 2020, and then along came COVID-19. So it's certainly been an interesting three and a bit years. Next slide, please. Now we'll just move on to how we actually navigated through that huge amount of change. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so the acquisitions. Um, as many people would know in the audience, uh, when you acquire um, companies, um, you tend to um, have multiplication of finance teams, systems, uh, locations, and importantly, culture. Um, these acquisitions that we undertook in 17 and 18, I'd argue, were actually reasonably textbook, um, and we absorbed them quite quickly um, and with only a minimal amount of disruption. I think here, from a finance point of view, the fact that we had already invested in cloud-based solutions meant that we could very quickly roll those out to the acquired entities. Um, and these solutions being easy to use also engendered them to the new people in my finance team. Um, and they could see that that was a step up from what they'd previously been using. Um, obviously, there was a lot of change um, and changing uh, reporting requirements, and, you know, different divisional structures. Um, and a Kalumo allowed me to very quickly issue um, partial solutions, if you like, uh, new solutions throughout this acquisition time very quickly um, so that the business could see that we were making progress towards the end goal. Um, we had weekly scrums uh, with a disparate team um, in the finance. Uh, they weren't all face-to-face, uh, -face, but we had weekly catch-ups via video conference throughout this time to make sure that everybody knew um, what we were aiming to achieve and what they were required to do. I think one of the big things that comes out with this acquisitions and when you're bringing people together, and that obviously uh, relates to the cultural action, act, um, aspects of an organization, is you really cannot afford to ignore soft skills. Um, we're a people business, and all businesses are people businesses, but um, valuation and property advisory, you know, we're a consulting uh, service. Therefore, we are absolutely a people business. So ignore those skills at your peril. Um, and if you don't communicate, you will fail. So it was very important throughout this to keep communicating, uh, not only with my growing and wide team, um, but also the rest of the business. Slide, please. So when you do a, any merger or acquisition, one of the things that you're trying to achieve is grow your top line without um, equivalent growth in the bottom line. Um, and I think this is demonstrated um, very clearly um, in the finance function. So L&W, when I joined, had eight in its team. 
Uh, we acquired MVS that had seven. We acquired Taylor Byrne that had five. And as at today, we now have eight. So the same number in the finance team as we had before all the acquisitions. Um, and with a further change in, account, in, in the valuation management systems that we're doing later this year, um, I'm letting another of our staff uh, move on to, to greener pastures, hopefully. So we'll end up with seven. So how do you achieve something like that? You know, the only way you can achieve that is to automate and systemate, systemize all of the data entry and the tasks. You've got to make the accounting function very much uh, an analysis function, um, a value added function rather than purely processing. Um, you know, our revenues almost trebled, our transaction volumes almost trebled, but we're doing that with the same number um, of staff as we had prior to the acquisitions. Um, that is the only way you can um, achieve it is by automation um, and making sure that your staff don't spend all their time doing the detail and that they have time to stick their head above the trenches um, and actually add value to the business. Cloud platforms and video conferencing, I think, are mandatory for us and for most organizations. But, you know, I still have uh, people spread between Sydney, regional Victoria, and Brisbane. Um, the only way that the finance team can function well is because we have great cloud platforms um, and great video conferencing technology. Next slide, please. Okay, so we got through our acquisitions and things were looking good. Um, we rolled into 2019 and then we had not one, but two cyber attacks. Um, and what actually happened first time around, we learned about it early in January 2019, where a UK uh, IT security company that monitors the dark web um, contacted us and said, oh, there's we think there's some of your documents um, on the dark web. And we went, oh my God, really? Um, anyway, we scratched the surface and very soon we found that yes, there'd been a whole heap of data stolen from our systems and published on the dark web. Um, our world changed overnight. Uh, a lot of our clients um, are banks um, and they were already in a challenging uh, position given the Banking Royal Commission um, in 2018, where they were very conscious about public perception um, and they had huge concerns about uh, private data belonging to their clients um, appearing on the dark web as it, were, as it was on the first attack. Um, so they quickly started suspending um, Acumentus or l and from their panels. Uh, effectively, our revenue started drying up very quickly. Um, and within a month or two, we'd lost 50% of our revenue. Um, we quickly engaged with our cyber insurers. Unfortunately, we had cyber insurance in place. If there's anybody out there that uh, works for an organization that doesn't have cyber insurance, I would uh, recommend that you absolutely investigate that straight away. Um, they certainly helped us navigate through this. Uh, we quickly pulled together um, a team of advisors, lawyers, IT specialists, um, um, our accountants, tax advisors, all sorts of, of people to help us get through all of this. Uh, my focus changed overnight. Um, suddenly I was managing multiple advisors, running an unbelievable number of board meetings. Um, as put up there, 54 board meetings in one year. Um, at the peak, we were running two to three board meetings a week. Um, I was negotiating debt facilities with our banks and, of course, keeping the ASX informed uh, of developments during this time. Um, one of the reasons for so many board meetings was that um, the company took advantage of the safe harbor protections under the Corporations Act. 
um, to allow us to continue to trade through um, what clearly was an existential crisis for the company. Um, but we could clearly see that if we could get through this, there was no reason why the company couldn't return to its former strength and then grow beyond that. Um, so, yeah, obviously, there's a possibility where you start losing 50% of your revenue, um, you've got huge advisor costs. Yeah, there's a, there's a clear and present danger um, of having to move into voluntary administration to protect the directors. Um, you know, from insolvent trading. Um, so that was clearly in our mind throughout um, a large part of 2019. Um, and it's certainly an interesting environment to, to work in. Um, what we could clearly see, though, is that if we could satisfy our clients that we've improved our IT security, um, there's no reason why they couldn't reinstate us um and the company could um, return stronger than it was before so there was a huge investment in it um and yeah finance works very closely with it our cio reports to myself um we managed to uh, achieve iso 27001 certification in under six months um which is you know may not be a record but it was certainly right up there um that in itself went a long way to being able to prove to our clients um, that our information security was strong um, and that they could therefore re-engage with us um, you know, without, without fear or with, with lower fear. I mean, I don't think that anybody can say that they're, they're completely bulletproof from cyber attacks, um, but certainly with... Um, appropriate measure and appropriate comfort that Acumentus um, was at the forefront now of, of data security um, and certainly better than maybe a lot of our um, competitors at that point in time who the banks continue to use. Um, yeah, arguably they may have been in blissful ignorance because there but for the grace of God go a lot of organizations. During this time as well, um, my CEO resigned and two of our non-executive directors resigned um, with the aim there of uh, yeah, um, satisfying the perception that somebody needed to take responsibility for what had actually happened. Um, I mean, arguably, um, it wasn't really their fault. And as it turned out, you know, it was a trusted insider. Um, that um, stole the data, uh, or certainly is alleged of stealing the data. Um, he's awaiting trial. Um, but you know, sometimes perceptions um, drive reality or override reality, um, and so those steps were taken. So I ended up with um, some new board members and a new CEO as well, um, and so that just adds to the uh, workload of the CFO. Um, we got to May and we restored most of our revenues, um, but then there was a second uh, data breach, and this time it involved um, not just data extracted from our valuation database, but individual ad hoc uh, records, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, policies, procedures, all sorts of stuff that was thrown up on a uh, document sharing website called Scribed. And we knew straight away that this now had to be somebody much closer to the organization, somebody you know, either within the organization or very close who was clearly trying to uh, damage uh, the organization. So again, we were plunged into crisis management, um, cash flow management, um, obviously uh, very important given the revenue losses um, and the incremental costs we were incurring to get us through all of this. Throughout 2019, the finance team had to adapt incredibly quickly. Um, you know, there wasn't a day go by when there wasn't some new requirements um, that we had to adapt to. Um, yeah, we still had to keep the day-to-day -day numbers going. And again, you know, I can't emphasize that if that wasn't all automated and running smoothly and the finance team didn't have the time to actually 
spend on more value add, then we wouldn't have had the time to actually respond to this and we may not have made it out the other side. Next slide, please. Hi, John, sorry to interrupt. Um, we've got about two minutes left. Okay, I'd better go a bit quicker then. <laughs> um, so, yeah, navigating through the change. So the next thing that we had to do was do a capital raise. Capital raise. Um, we had a critical need for cash because of the, the uh, money we burnt through. Um, and through this time, we had to also then do a lot of forecasting uh, to put together the prospectus for the capital raise. There's lots of due diligence, lots of advisors, and we had to do this really quickly. Um, at the same time, we were actually helping the New South Wales Cyber Police Squad uh, with their investigations. Next slide. So then we got to the end of 2019 and the suspect was arrested and we thought, phew, at last we can move on. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case because the suspect is an insider. Another large client then decided to suspend our work. They'd stood by us. They were a government client and they'd stood by us through 2019. That then involved a, another round of investment, uh, very agilely, very quickly, releasing a new valuation management system um, three months ahead of when we thought we were going to release it um, so we could switch systems. And then we worked very quickly within four months to have that IRAP certified. Um, that got us to February 2020. We were back on track. And then, of course, COVID came along. OK, so the lessons learned. Um, next slide, please. Looking back over the last 18 months, it seems a bit surreal, to be honest. Uh, we survived. We're back. Uh, many companies wouldn't have survived. Um, I think many finance teams and senior executive teams wouldn't have been able to navigate through such um, a period of turmoil. It's certainly character building. Uh, being truly agile allowed us to actually pivot and respond to all of the things that were thrown our way. Um, for me, I think, you know, don't panic. <laughs> Easy to say, uh, maybe a bit harder to do. Focus on small steps towards achieving that goal. Um, and that's very much agile, you know, releasing um, updates every few days, um, concentrating on those little bits rather than getting overwhelmed with the uh, end goal, how big it might be. Use experts, don't be afraid to ask. Um, you know, no man is an island, no woman is an island. You, there's lots of people around you that can help and you need to make sure that you ask for help. And above all, you need to communicate all the way through. We had to let our clients know what was going on, the police know what was going on, the ASX know what was going on. There was a huge amount of communication and with our staff as well. Um, very quickly, the last couple of slides. Move. So the future for Acumentus and the finance team, next slide. Um, more change, we can um, expect that. We're obviously working through COVID-19 at the moment. Um, the business is back um, rebuilt and um, returning to strength. So now we're looking at further diversification of services. Obviously, flexible working arrangements have been forced upon us by COVID. Um, we've worked really well with those. Um, and so we anticipate that that will continue. Um, we've got to look at succession planning. Um, most organizations are not particularly good at succession planning. Um, we're no different. Um, but an agile business is better at success for succession planning anyway. Um, that's because people below you have been given the space to grow and develop. And of course, we'll continue to use Columo um, and expand that across the rest of the business. That's it, thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of my presentation, Danga. Uh, th thank you, John. Uh, thank you for that very informative presentation. And yes, you would have, you've had a very high tempo uh, work for about 18 months, so you need a rest. So just to give you a bit of rest, I, I want to ask Dominic a question first. Uh, Dominic, this is from Antonio. Uh, you mentioned that there is no sub substitute for face-to-face, -face, or is that video conferencing through low effective? 
is not a replacement for face-to-face -face in enabling a completely agile process. Yeah, I think we're going to see um, we're going to see this morph as a result of COVID. I think prior to COVID, um, you know, I think a lot of communication is non-verbal, uh, and our videos are still not quite there. That said, I think the productivity of being able to use video has increased, and, and the facilities are more there. So I would always favour face-to-face over a video conference. But that said, um, video conference is so much better than email uh, for these conversations. So I think it's uh, it, it, for us and the way I explain it to our team is there's a hierarchy here. Pick the highest point in the hierarchy you can. Uh, and in COVID, that's probably video conference. And uh, John, so another question from Antonio. Um, so finance teams not being agile, um, according to Antonio, is driven by finance not uh, being the last to receive a budget to spend. Uh, <laughs> so... How, how do you go about convincing a board uh, to invest in these sort of um, uh, technologies? Yeah, so I think uh, the first thing is, you know, the modern way of um, investing in technology is via subscription. So um, I haven't paid an upfront cost for a major system any time in the last few years. Um, so I think the first thing is you, you've got to look at subscription services, which avoids that high upfront cost. I think also you then need to challenge your suppliers um, to come up with a proof of concept very quickly, um, ideally at no cost. Um, and certainly um, organisations like Colomo are quite Steady willing on, to... Sorry? Steady on, no cost, come on. I, I'm quite <laughs> willing to uh, invest a little bit of time uh, <laughs> to come up with a proof of concept. Um, <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, and you know, if you can demonstrate something tangible to the board, they can start to see the value. Um, I notice you've talked about quantifying the ROI, and I know lots of software companies throw up little models where they arguably come up with the ROI. And, you know, recruitment companies, HR companies, everybody does this, and I think there's a degree of skepticism over over uh, what this spits out. So I don't tend to try and use those. Um, but typically, I'm trying to demonstrate the value, um, and you know, quite often you are looking at a trade-off between a software system automating something and then removing um, a cost or replacing a cost. Um, or uh, the better story is to add some value and show the business how this can actually grow the business. So yeah, I'm I'm not a strong believer in a spreadsheet that says this investment's got an ROI of you know 15% um, because I think boards are quite skeptical on those. Thanks, John. Uh, uh, time for one last question. This is from Rachel. Uh, her company has just acquired a new business. Uh, her team her team is working on transitioning the work from the acquired business to her team but they're facing resistance and uh, an unwillingness to share or release information. How, do, how would you, what recommendation would you have for Rachel in handling this sort of situation? Yeah, well, I guess a lot there depends on what's going to happen to the team that is providing the information. If that, if that team is slated for redundancy, um, then immediately you do have a real challenge. Um, the way I've handled that scenario in the past is um, to be open and honest with the team, let them know that. Let them know that if they find a job sooner, that you will let them go earlier, even though that might cause pain for yourself. Um, and then ideally uh, give them a financial incentive to work through what's happening um, and handing over the information. So. If they know that they're going to be made redundant, you know, it's uncomfortable, it's not nice, nobody likes that. But if they can see that you're being open and honest and you're trying your best to look after them via potentially an early release, um, an additional discretionary payment before they leave, if they work with you um, to deliver the information. Obviously, the better approach is that, you know, one or more of that team will become part of your team and you can take them under your wing um, and mentor them. And if they feel the love, if you like, uh, that way, then that's another way of doing it. So it really 
depends on the on the circumstances. Thanks, John. Look, and I, I have a lot more questions before we run out of time. So, um, so once again, thank you to Kalumo for sponsoring today's webinar, and to Dominic and John for their excellent presentations. And I now hand back to Melissa to finish off the session. Thanks everyone for your participation today. Um, so in the next three working days, you will receive an evaluation survey accompanied by a recording of this webinar. We really appreciate your feedback as it is extremely valuable to help us deliver better events for you. Thanks again and we look forward to welcoming you to another CPA Australia webinar. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks for your time today.